They have re-signed Shane Pinto to a one-year contract with $775,000. He's expected to play in Philadelphia on Sunday afternoon. They might also have another centerman who's been out since January the 9th. And Josh Norris took a bad spill in that game against Calgary, and he might be ready for the game on Sunday as well. So now there's a glut of centermen right now that we need to talk about. But first, the Pinto deal... Uh, what is your thought on a one-year contract for this guy at $775,000 per year? Exactly what I thought it would be, Steve. Uh, he has no leverage. He really just wants to play. Uh, so I, I figured it would be the minimum or maybe a little above the minimum, and it turns out the minimum is seven fifty. He's getting seven seventy five, which works out to a little less than four hundred, I guess, for the year for him. Um, it's It's pretty much it's the smart thing to do for both right the senators didn't need to to uh to break the bank here uh they they they're in a position of strength with a guy who wants to play and of course with their salary cap issues they can't afford to sign him to a one million or a two million or or much more than that even um and on his side what's he gonna do oh well here here this is what we're offering you take it or leave it and you know he took it makes sense to me yeah i mean it's uh I think it's a hat in hand sort of thing. Kind of just glad to get this behind him. The 41 game suspension is over after the game against Winnipeg on Saturday afternoon. And again, he'd probably play uh, against Philadelphia on Sunday. I think he's in a mode of after the 41 game suspension for violating the league's gambling rules. I think he's just kind of going, sorry about all that. Uh, Let's just get through this season. And he actually can sign an extension as of now, even though he just signed, re-signed as an RFA this one-year contract, he is eligible to go long-term anytime he and the Sens want to do that. But for now, it's a matter of just kind of getting back in the lineup. One thing that was kind of interesting, I saw a report today that gave more specifics, not dramatically different than what we've been reporting here on the podcast, but apparently the egregious sin of having a friend back home log into his DraftKings account to set his fantasy football lineup for that week. That apparently was, according to reports today that we're seeing, that was specifically what had occurred. And if that's it, I mean, we're not even talking about gambling. We're just talking about a fantasy football roster being set for the week. If that is in fact the case, if that is in fact what happened, 41 games seems awfully harsh. Yeah, it does. But I think the other the other shoe here is, this is the first guy. Somebody broke one of the rules. Let's come down hard in hopes that we don't have to do anything ever again. Right. <laughs> right. Like, Cause you know that if somebody's betting on games, if they actually get somebody betting on hockey games, he's probably gone for life for, for crying out loud. Yeah. Right. So you've now established a bar. Yes. It was a minimal thing, which is what we thought it was all along His his buddy logged into his account. That's not allowed. So to give him half a season that sets a bar for anything more serious than that's going to be a lot more games than that, obviously. And I really think that, like I just said, if you bet on actual NHL games, you're probably uh, like a year or maybe life. Yeah, the league is paranoid about it, and they should be because they've climbed into bed with all of these gambling sites. They're making hundreds of millions of dollars on their support. They're allowing gambling sites to be part of their regular programming. I'm I have nothing against it being a commercial, but it's actually part of the programming now, you know, in the intermission analysis. So the NHL has every right to be paranoid about it because they're helping to uh, foster this whole circumstance. So it's just, I mean, anything for money, I guess, right? Yeah. And it, like the opening of every Sens game on TSN anyway, we get Mark Mathot's bets for the night. Here's the three things I'm going with. And in the intermissions, in the pregame and in the intermissions on Hockey Night in Canada, you get it every time too. The let's ch- I can't remember what they call it, the check the line or whatever it is. They go to this special segment where one of them does a big diatribe on why you should bet on this and bet on that or don't bet on this or this is a good bet. It's it, – it, <laughs> It's silly. It's just, it's inundated. Uh, Ian had a really good article this week on The Athletic about uh, what does this mean for for athletes of this day and age? Because these are certain athletes today at a certain age range. They've grown up with everything's on your phone. There's an app for this, there's an app for that. They've been doing these things all along since they were teenagers. They've had this access to do all these things. And now it's just, it's right there in your face and it's just pushed at you and pushed at you, all the commercials. And it's just... It's crazy. I, I I don't know what the solution is. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I, the, just the fact that they're promoting it as heavily as they are, they should expect more Shane Pinto stories. And I think, I think you're right. They, they, they see it coming. Like they see the storm clouds brewing, I'm sure. Um, mm. And again, they brought it on themselves, but they need to uh, need to make sure that as they collect all this gambling money, that their players aren't engaging in it. Um, it's all very, I don't know, hypocritical in, in my opinion. But let's go to Shane Pinto. He spoke about his return, his signing with the club. Special day, he actually returned to the club a week ago and began practicing. So he's got a week of practicing under his belt. He signs the contract here as we record today on Friday, January 19th. I worry that he might look disorganized in defensive zone coverage. Well, that, that would put him in lockstep with much of the club from the first half of the season. Um, no, but they, now it's going to be interesting because Norris, Josh Norris, who's been out since January 9th, uh, he had the regular jersey on at Friday morning practice. He might be back tomorrow. Who knows? But he might be back Sunday too. And the point is you've got four very good centermen none of whom that you would ideally like to see skating in the limited minutes of a fourth liner. So you get Tim Stutzla, Josh Norris, uh, now you get Shane Pinto back and re-signed and ready to roll the suspension over, and Ridley Gregg, who has kind of looked, well, he's looked really good on a pseudo number one line with Brady Kachuk and Claude Giroux. Like, this isn't an easy decision. It's a good decision to have. Obviously, you want depth at the center ice position, but it's going to be kind of a tricky decision for Jacques Martin. What do you think happens? Well, I think, first of all, poor Rourke Chartier is gone. <laughs> he's he's back to Belleville. I I, I believe Eddie Cas Eddie. <laughs> Mark Kastelik will stay in the lineup. And uh, I, I, I think that it's Greg moves to the wing. And it's Pinto and Greg in your, in your third line. And it's Norris and Stutzla in the other two slots. Maybe Greg's not on the third line. But I think Greg moves to the wing. And Norris slides back in, whether it's on the first line or the second line. And then you've got you know, Pinto probably plays center more so than Greg. Greg's more suited to play the wing. Uh, I did some checking, and, and Shane Pinto was 52% in the draws last year as a rookie. Um, he's far better than than really Greg, who's at uh, 42% right now. So Pinto's going to be the one that's going to play center. I don't think he'll have a problem playing D zone coverage with this team. I think he was probably one of the better players they have as far as understanding his role. And he's younger and more malleable and more more apt to do what he's told to do and what's expected of him in the D zone. So I'm not worried about him playing center at all. Um, but that's the way I see it anyway. How, how are you viewing things? Well, first, let me address what you just said there. I was making a joke earlier about Shane yes, I know in defensive zone coverage, not because he's – I'm just because he hasn't played in a year, he might be scuffling a little bit in D zone coverage under Jacques Martin, brand new coach. I meant it from that perspective. I think in general, Shane Pinto might be the best two way yeah. centerman they have, but we shall see uh, how things look in the early going. Um, I would tend to agree with you. I think all things being equal, had I not seen how Ridley Gregg looks with uh, with Kachuk and Drew, I don't know if I want to muck with that right now. So True. I think in the short term, um, I'm, I might go ahead and let Shane Pinto center that fourth line until he kind of gets his legs under him and let the Ridley Gregg thing play out. Maybe that uh, maybe that cools off a little bit, but they sure have looked good in the last three, four games. So I probably will handle it that way. And I think eventually, once Ridley or once uh, Shane Pinto has his legs under him, then you elevate him in the lineup. You move Greg over to the wing, and I, I'd. I, I'm inclined to keep Castellick on the on the wing and keep Rourke Sharchi around. Maybe send Zach McEwen down and uh, and uh, mm. leave Parker Kelly on that fourth line. But uh, wow. no, I don't I don't automatically think Rourke Sharchi is, is is gone unless you um, decide you know permanently to keep uh, Shane Pinto on a fourth line situation, which we all know is not going to happen. But it is but, a good problem to have, I think, all in all. 